Now, what we do when we recreate this piece of the, the brain is uh, we don't uh, try to make it perform a particular function. This is very important. We call it bottom-up building and top-down validation. So the model is not designed to do object recognition or face recognition or anything intelligent. The model is built according to biological rules. And what we then do is we check to see how this model can capture uh, experimental data. We take data of, of other experiments, we mimic those experiments in the model, and uh, we see whether these emergent properties happen. They're not programmed to happen. And uh, all the papers that we found so far, this is another one, they can recreate the experimental emergent properties that have been found. In this case, it's a paper that shows that the, the brain actually wakes up at a certain frequency of stimulation. You stimulate, stimulate, and suddenly it wakes up. And when we do that, you actually can recreate, you see the same phenomena occurring. And not only does it occur, but if you actually analyze the spectral graph of the oscillations or the way that the cells resonate with each other, we discover emergent properties that were missed in experiments. And with these, and this is gamma oscillations, which is a very important way that neurons can actually bind their activity together, we discovered gamma oscillations can be generated within the same little piece of the brain, but the power of it is, you know, you can get gamma oscillations with any simple model. But if you did that, you wouldn't be able to trace back and say it's this cell and it's this molecule and it's this synapse. With a detailed model, if you get this without having programmed it, you can then trace back the causal mechanisms behind this. And this gives you a much more fundamental way to study the mechanisms of the brain. We're now being able to, we can simulate the local fields that are generated by these cells. And um, you can combine them to look at the, the, the whole space or this 3D volume of uh, electrical fields generated, which is a precursor to doing EEG. EEG is a way that you go to the clinic and they put these little electrodes on and you can get maps. This is the step before EEG. Now, um, so this can be also captured in simulations. The, the, the important thing here is that this we can't do on the blue gene today uh, we, because this now changes your mode of communication. This is going to explode the bandwidth. Before we were just transmitting spikes between the, the cores. Now we have to transmit a lot more information. So this is post-processing at this stage and we will have to find other solutions to be able to do this for a whole brain. We take this further and in order to study the emergent behaviors, not just the emergent properties, but the emergent behaviors, couple this model, uh, hopefully as close to real time as possible. We're, depending on how much you want to read, we're at about 100 times real time. Um, couple the uh, emergent properties to an, a virtual robot or a real robot. The value of this is that if, and we don't know, when we haven't done this experiment yet, we're setting, it to do, uh, setting up to do it, but with all the learning rules and all the reward mechanisms inserted into this model, if this model can support an avatar to make anything intelligent, a decision, um, remember where the, which door has the reward, that very moment you'll be able to trace back the causal chain of events that lead to complex uh, behaviors. If you had built a simple model, you will have a very intelligent robot, but you will not know what caused it in the brain. If you have a model that is built from the bottom as detailed as possible, and it can support this behavior, you will be, have a systematic way to trace the causal chain of events that lead to intelligence. So, of course, we're not staying at the column level. We're going beyond the column, and this is... Uh, the way that we can do it. You can see there's a lot of fibers that are extending out here. They are, they're going to many other areas and we're going to get to that challenge later. But now we can start combining columns together and connecting them together to build a brain region and start mapping out the whole of the neocortex. 
And um, this is the first simulations, which we can now do. We do this on a blue gene P, which is 16,000 plus cores. Um, we can actually get to probably about a million uh, neurons uh, with a, over a billion synapses. This is 360,000 neurons. But you see here we've already hit the limitations of any visualization technology today. We cannot visualize all this. Uh, so I can just show you the points. But those are really detailed neurons. And what we need to be able to do is to capture that in detail so that we can navigate inside there and see it. So in summary, there are many different, in summary for this part, there are many different ways that we can get to the human brain. And we have mapped out a chart where we need to synthesize the cells, we need to synthesize the ultrastructure, we need to map out the fibers, because the more macroscopic constraints you have, the more you'll be able to specify and, and the, the microscopic details of the brain. So this is more or less the, the roadmap that we have charted. And I get into a lot of trouble for saying 10 years. Uh, 10 years, provided there's the funding, and provided you guys come up with the supercomputers. But that's happening. We could see that in the previous presentation. But it's 10 years, provided there's funding. This doesn't come from the air. But if that, if that does happen, we, we should be able to move along this roadmap. So before we started, it was basically possible to build one neuron. It was running on a single PC. Uh, by 2008, we had built the first cortical column, 10,000 neurons. Today, we're at about 100x of that. And uh, we should be able to reach that. In fact, this is technically possible, for example, on the ULIC machine. Uh, we don't have all the biological detail to specify it, but it's technically possible to simulate 100 million neurons on ULIC's uh, blue gene machine. Um, we'd need about an exascale to get to the human brain at the cellular level. But again, what we're doing with the multi-scale strategy is that we'll be able to go in, 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 as needed into deeper st simulations that are much more precise. Well, again, it's not just a model. It's not just a simulation. If to do this, you have to do a global integration. You have to integrate all the neuroscience from the genes all the way up to the phenotype, the emergent behaviors. You have to database this information. We apply this predictive reverse engineering to look for rules and patterns and, and um, to make predictions to help us specify the details of the brain. You have mathematical abstractions that go across all levels. You have to build models of all the different levels. and you have to have the capability to do virtual experimentation. There are multiple representations, which explodes the data space that you need. Uh, it is a massive data challenge. If you just look at the spatial data, you're looking at full human brain, uh, going to put some serious strain on the amount of uh, memory that would be needed. Um, this is our current HPC sort of uh, environment, uh, where, uh, which we have. But of course, this is going to have to expand significantly to be able to get close to this roadmap. Uh, you also have to workflow everything, uh, almost everything. You have to create a way that you can use this quite interactively and easily. Um, in fact, the key is to put the scientist in the loop. This has almost got to become a black box so that a scientist can specify details of the brain according to either hypothesis of a disease or some new information about uh, a new protein or a new cell or a new synapse and put it in and it will compile a new model. So we have built the first facility. It's a prototype facility that allows us to do this. It's, it's a huge software stack that that enables us today to build microcircuits. We can already build, actually this is an old slide, we can already build small brain regions. Um, and in fact, it's a generic facility. So it's not a model. It's a generic facility that allows us to build any microcircuit and provided that you can specify certain amounts of biological data. But what you really want in the end uh, is to be able to do virtual steering and interactive supercomputing. Uh, 
it's, it's just not going to be possible to build a model of the brain without physically interacting as you're building it. And you're going to want to, this is not a simulation, this is the data, it's like how you would want to fly through a model and at any moment in time stop and analyze or at any moment in time stop and run a simulation, a different kind of simulation or build a virtual instrument, a virtual microscope and map and measure another feature. So this of course is going to, pay, to put a huge strain on the kind of software or perhaps even the kind of hardware that is going to allow us to be able to do this um, in any reasonable uh, real-time mode. So that's why you run out of resources. We had to go for this big proposal for the, what we call now the Human Brain Project. Um, and in this project what we aim to do is to build two cockpits, a simulation cockpit which will be the sort of display end point of all this huge software stack that will allow us to integrate the biological information build models, simulate, design experiments, design virtual instruments, virtual microscopes or virtual imaging systems so that we can actually do what we do in the lab but on a model. Uh, this will sit in Lausanne and we also aim to build a cockpit for high performance computing. I think that when you get to this stage uh, it's going to become very difficult to optimize these kinds of exascale and beyond systems and uh, a mission control center where you'll be able to look and see bottlenecks and analyze them and have them uh, indicated in, in as, as fast as possible during a simulation because there are many different modes of, of simulation you'd be able to improve the rate of hardware software co-design and hopefully come up with the kind of system that is going to meet the specific needs of brain simulation we're aiming for this to be a generic system which means you can come in with your earth simulation application or software stack and uh, optimize the high performance computing system to deal with that and the focus is not just getting speed or memory but the whole end to end value chain. Um, to take that further this is not a project that sits there and serves a couple of scientists the goal is to make this open to the community worldwide and to allow everybody to start uh, using this facility as a research instrument as a research tool it's not about it solving anything it is about us using a new research tool or instrument to explore deeper and deeper into the brain and to allow us to investigate any hypothesis about the brain and uh, we aim to create this uh, I suppose you could call it an ecosystem that would allow uh, this brain simulation to serve as a service. So in conclusion this is uh, some of the team, it's actually not all the team. The key people here of course are Felix Schumann, he's also here in the audience who has been the uh, key guiding glue that has steered this team through all the different technological barriers. Um, Sean Hill who was originally from IBM but then he defected and he came and worked on the project and he's now um, actually the director of what's called the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility but also still on the project and um, I'd just like to thank very much IBM for their amazing participation over many years. David Kremies, Dave Turek, uh, Bernie Mason. Uh, it's, it's really an incredible company to work with and the, the, the capabilities that we have got through many, many years of discussion have been incredibly valuable. And lastly, but not leastly, you can see Bob Bishop, and I'm sure you all know Bob. Bob sitting over there looking over, uh, sometimes in amusement, I think, uh, at what we're trying to do and sometimes I think, think feeling that he was a bit younger so that he can actually jump in and help us and actually solve some of these key challenges. But Bob has been very important in giving us advice and warnings about particular areas that we may or may not solve soon but we intend solving them and lastly it's not in my mind any longer an option to ask whether it's possible to simulate the brain the only question we have to ask now 
is what it's going to take to make it possible.